Well, this past month, Julie Andrews turned 87 years old, and the kids are like, who's Julie Andrews? <laughs> but younger people might remember her from the Princess Diaries. Older folks probably associate her with the sound of music. But her most iconic role is probably that of the kind and magical nanny, Mary Poppins. Everyone loves Mary Poppins, right? She's firm but fair, formal but fun, and she's the perfect caregiver. The creator of Mary Poppins was author P.L. Travers, and Travers never had children of her own, surprisingly, but she did have the opportunity at one point to adopt twins. And those twins would have hit the jackpot, right? This was the author of Mary Poppins, after all. But life is no storybook, and the days of P.L. Travers weren't exactly enchanted. So I apologize in advance. I'm about to ruin Mary Poppins for you. But the story of P.L. Travers perfectly sets up our brand new series of messages. Pamela Lyndon Travers was born on August 9, 1899, in the Australian bush to an Irishman named Travers and an Aussie named Margaret. Her birth name was Helen Goff. Despite her father's struggle with alcohol, Helen had fond memories of her parents. But her father died when she was just a child, and Helen spent the rest of her life in search of a father figure. As a teenager, she was sent to boarding school in Sydney, and she found great success writing prose and poetry. But Helen was also quite talented on the stage, even doing Shakespeare for a short time. It was then that she adopted the stage name Pamela Lyndon Travers in honor of her deceased father. At the age of 25, she immigrated to London, where she met poet George William Russell, who helped her writing career immensely. Travers also became the disciple of an occultist named George Ivanovich Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff was a snake oil salesman who fathered seven children with seven different women. But he piqued Travers' interest in magic, mystery, and the supernatural. And speaking of magic, it was about this time that she started writing the Mary Poppins fantasy series, making Travers a household name. Pamela Lyndon Travers was living large. At 40 years old, she was rich, famous, and carefree. But life has a way of throwing curveballs. Pamela had befriended an older Irish couple in the writing community whose lives were spiraling out of control. Twin boys had been dropped off at their doorstep by their feckless adult child, and they just couldn't handle the stress. They needed help. But the unmarried Travers had always wanted children. She was a children's author, after all. So the grandparents arranged for Pamela to adopt the twins. But when she arrived, she casually informed the couple that after consulting her astrologer, she decided only to adopt one of the boys. So she took the more beautiful of the two brothers and callously left the other one behind. The chosen one was named Camillus, and he was whisked away to a doting life of luxury in London, but the rejected one, Anthony, was foisted upon impoverished and disinterested relatives. It's no wonder that in later interviews, P.L. Travelers, Travelers never answered questions about her personal life. A movie about her life came out in 2013 called Saving Mr. Banks, starring Emma Thompson and Tom Hanks. The boys weren't even mentioned in the film. And according to the testimony of her own son, Travers was never much of a mom. She dragged Cumulus all over the world, showing him off to the literati and putting him in the finest schools. But he said he always felt like a showpiece. So Camillus grew up resenting his mother, but that was just the beginning. Somehow, Camillus's long-lost brother, Anthony, had learned that he was a twin. So when he turned 17, he showed up unannounced at Travers's house. Pamela fainted when she saw him, and upon regaining consciousness, she promptly had her housekeeper throw him out. How do you like that? But Travers was determined to keep Camillus from finding out about his brother. Well, he did eventually. Anthony was able to track down Camillus, and they celebrated with a three-day drinking binge. But Anthony never got over Pamela's rejection of him, both as a baby and as an adult. And he was always tormented by his brother's life of luxury. Camillus was living off the royalties from Walt Disney's Mary Poppins movie while Anthony was living hand to mouth. Anthony's marriage eventually fell apart and he died from alcohol abuse. 
Only a handful of mourners showed up at his funeral, including his inebriated brother. But Camillus also begrudged his mother for withholding the truth from him. She had always told him that he was her natural son from a late sugar tycoon. That seems like an oddly complicated backstory to keep up. But Camillus hated her for keeping him from his siblings and cousins and aunts and uncles. And his liver gave out a few years later. You ever watch the Parent Trap movie? You ever see that franchise? Twins are separated at birth, but hilarity ensues when they are reunited by chance years later, resulting in a happy family reunion. Well, Camillus and Anthony are what you get in a real life parent trap. P.L. Travers has been described as steely, selfish, and domineering, the opposite of her beloved Mary Poppins. And she lived in a fantasy world. Her poor choices destroyed her relationship with her son, and she died a lonely woman. Why does it seem that most people's stories have an unhappy ending? And every parent worries about somehow pulling a P.L. Travers. We're terrified of messing up our kids, right? Life isn't a movie after all, and we're no Mary Poppins, that's for sure. But parents are facing challenges today that not even the rich imagination of P.L. Travers could have imagined. And I'm, con see, I'm convinced that their greatest challenge that parents are facing today, the greatest practical challenge, is monitoring their children's complicated relationship with technology. No other generation of parents has had to deal with anything like it. Youth culture is changing faster than ever. Traps are being set for children quicker than parents can spring them. And the next thing you know, the kids are all grown up in the blink of an iPhone. So I'm going to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 11 through 15. If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take one of ours out from the shelf underneath the pew in front of you and turn to page 993. 993 in your pew Bible to find 1 Timothy 5, or you can use your smartphone to scan the QR code on the worksheet in your bulletin. It'll take you straight there. There is no more difficult task in the world than parenting. The hours are long and the stakes are high. There's no objective standard for evaluation. The results are never guaranteed. And it's the only job in the world that costs you money. Yet despite all the traps into which parents and kids can fall, the Bible says precious little about it. We just don't have much to go on. But even in its silence, the word of God speaks volumes and the lessons are applicable to all of us, not just parents. But before we start, I think it's important for us to establish a baseline. There are dozens of different parenting philosophies out there and thousands of books. And then you have parents who host podcasts and maintain social media pages where they brag about how wonderful their kids are turning out. It's funny how they never put their kids' tantrums on Facebook. But here in the real world, we're struggling, aren't we? There's no storybook here. We need help. So as any good Christian would do, we go to scriptures. And here's what we get. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's it. That's the only specific parenting instructions we really get from the New Testament. But as we've already mentioned, the Bible's relative silence on the topic speaks volumes. I believe there's a good reason for Scripture being very vague about raising kids. And the reason is this. Parenting, by nature, is experimental. Right? Think about that for just a moment. Parenting is hyper-specific to your context. Every parent's different. Every kid's different. Every environment's different. So the Bible gives some very general principles about parenting, but it holds back on giving maybe the real specific advice that we would all like to hear, which honestly probably wouldn't be real helpful in your particular context anyway because all these contexts are different. I really believe that good parenting is one part common sense and the other part just winging it. Think about it again. In Bible times, 
teenagers were getting married and having babies. This is where their culture was. Do you think any of them knew what they were doing? Do you think any of them read parenting scrolls? Do you think they even worried about it? They didn't have the time and energy to entertain existential parenting crises as we do. It's all they could do to keep their kids from dying from tuberculosis. So their philosophy of of parenting was very simple. They just kind of shut up and did it. So here's my best advice I can give you about parenting. I want you to get on Amazon and carefully pick out some books on parenting. Or you can check some out at the library. There's hundreds of them to choose from. I'll even let you borrow some of mine. And then on a nice warm day, I want you to go find a, a quiet stream. This, this week, there's going to be a nice week this week. And, and you can even pack a picnic if you want to make a day of it. But leave the kids at home. And once you get comfortable, take out these books and take a deep breath and dump them in the water. Folks, I know you want to be good parents. And young parents are especially eager to go to the experts for help. And I get that. And I'm not anti-expert. There's some good in those things. I'm, I'm trying to make it funny. But I want you to think about something. We all know good parents who are strict. We all know good parents who are more relaxed. We all know good parents who push their kids to greatness and those who... Let their kids figure it out on their own. And we all know families that have both good kids and difficult children in the same family, right? Despite being raised in the exact same environment. So I'm going to let you in on a little secret. No one knows what they're talking about when it comes to your family. No one knows what they're doing, including this guy up here. I know my kids. I don't know your situation. There are just too many different factors for anyone to be an expert on all families. Only you are an expert on your family. The closest thing we got to one anyway. And of course, Jesus. So I can show you some very general principles from Scripture, and I can tell you what's working with in our family and what's not, but you're just as smart as I am when it comes to parenting. That, by the way, is why we host a monthly parenting small group here. And the next one will be next Sunday at at 5.30. Uh, But we learn from one another, just like they did in Bible times. I don't teach. We learn from uh, our parents' example. Uh, We learn from one another. And it's really a good time. So I really want to encourage you next Sunday. If you're a parent, 5.30 or 5.30 p.m., We'll be meeting here, and and you can join that. But I'm going to tell you something. Today is not your parents' adolescence. Parenting has changed in the blink of an iPhone. Children today are dealing with technological issues that previous generations could have never anticipated. It just is. So how on earth, you might ask, can the New Testament, which was written over 2,000 years ago, possibly speak to any of these high-tech issues. Well, as we're about to see from today's passage, technology may change, but people don't, right? So let's look at the passage, just a short little passage today, 1 Timothy 5, 11 through 13. It says this, but refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. Well, there you have it. I finally lost my mind. I'm taking some weird passage about widows in ancient times and trying to make a connection to parents of the iPhone generation. But don't write me off until you hear what I have to say about the background of this passage. The Apostle Paul was writing to his protege, Timothy, And Timothy was the pastor of the church in the ancient city of Ephesus. But the church had a problem. The Christians were so kind and generous and Jesus-like that all the widows in the city were coming to the church for financial help. And that's great, right? But as often happens when it comes to charity, people's good intentions made things worse, not better. The church was giving away money, 
which helped these widows in the short term, but the long-term result was becoming a bit of a disaster. The widows simply stopped working. They didn't need to anymore. That seems pretty good for them, right? We would all like to quit working, but we would quickly find out that the lack of meaningful work makes us miserable. These widows simply had too much time on their hands. Again, you don't have to, uh, you know, you don't have time to have an existential crisis when you're working hard to meet the needs of your family or yourself. So to occupy their yearning minds, these widows were engaging in all sorts of frivolous activities. Now, they didn't know that this was happening to them, of course, but Paul knew. So Paul advised Timothy to support the older widows who could not conceivably work anymore, but not the younger widows who could realistically still support themselves. It's not that the church was stingy. It's not that the church didn't care. Quite the opposite. But this was truly in those widows' best interest. This would keep the widows from falling into the various traps mentioned in this passage. So what does this have to do with parenting? Well, believe it or not, the problems that these widows were facing way back then are the exact same symptoms from which we and our kids are suffering from in the age of the iPhone. Think about it. Technology has made our lives so much easier. And in many ways, it has made our lives better. Almost everything today takes less time than it used to. And I don't want to go back. Our lives are very, very convenient. We have more free time than any generation before us. And that's genuine progress. It's good. We don't have to work as hard as previous generations to have our everyday needs met. But all that extra time is leading to the exact same problem for us that the widows in today's passage faced when they suddenly found themselves with nothing to do, or at least very little to do. These problems may take a different form in our technological age, but the underlying issue is the same. Technology changes, but people don't. The availability of the internet has changed everything in our culture in the blink of an iPhone. That's no new take, obviously, but people are still the same. And while technology has solved some of our practical problems, it hasn't resolved our personal issues, right? And that's our main point from today's passage. It's in your bulletin if you want to write it down to remember. The main point is people can improve technology. Technology can't improve people. That goes for you, me, parents, children. People can improve technology, but technology can't improve people. King Solomon recognized this in Ecclesiastes 6.10. He said, whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is. No matter what comes to be in this world, it's always known what man is and who they are. No matter how far man advances technologically, he's still human. And in today's passage, we see that ancient people with too much time on their hands fell into the same traps we do, just in a different context. So what's the first trap mentioned here in our passage? Well, the younger widows were giving in to their passions. Welcome to the modern world. It may have looked a little different when they gave in to their passions, but people are still people, and people turn every technological advancement into a new way to indulge their sexual urges. The consumption of pornography in our culture is higher than it's ever been, but that's not because people are worse than they used to be. People don't change, it's just that pornography is more accessible than it's ever been. If people had iPhones in the 1950s, they'd be doing the same thing. People don't change. So I'm not concerned that people are somehow getting worse, that's not the case. But as a parent, I am concerned that kids today are losing their innocence much sooner due to the easy accessibility of internet via smartphones. Back in the day, you had to sneak around, right? You had to work to find it. You had to do it on purpose. But everything changed in the blink of an iPhone. Today, your kids are virtually guaranteed to be exposed to pornography without even trying. And it will happen. You can't stop it. With the smartphone, pornography has become both portable and discreet. 
well, I just won't give my kid a smartphone. Well, that's fine. But how are you going to keep their friends' smartphones away from them? I hate to break it to you, but most parents don't restrict their kids' smartphone usage or internet access in any way. That's just statistics. And I can't understand that. Maybe they're naive. Maybe they've just kind of given up on, on stopping it. But we have it. We want to maintain our children's innocence as long as we can. So you can and should be vigilant in monitoring and restricting your kids' smartphone usage when and if you determine they're old enough to have one. But something will eventually slip by. These things aren't foolproof. Restrictions are good, important. They're not a fail-safe because your kid knows more about his smartphone than you do. They're good, though, because these restrictions can delay the first exposure to pornography. So I know this is a very frank discussion, but that's okay. We need to have frank discussions. Restrictions can delay the first exposure. You see, our brains as, as adults are like dried cement, right? So it takes a lot more to traumatize us, uh, but not so with kids. Kids' minds are impressionable. And you know what? Children generally have no self-control, and this makes pornography more than a moral problem. It's also a mental and emotional health problem. It desensitizes our brains. It robs our kids of the simple pleasures in life. And we don't want that for them, right? So the longer their little brains are allowed to develop before their first exposure, the less potential damage it can do. And if we intervene fast enough when they are exposed, then it can help really make a difference in their long-term mental and emotional health. Listen, it's very prevalent. You know that. Everyone will be exposed to it thanks to our technology today. But you can take steps to delay the first exposure or at least limit it when it does happen. And that's if they have a smartphone or not. They will be exposed to it. So I don't mean to sound fatalistic. It's not that I'm trying to scare us or bum us out or anything like that. I just want to be you to be prepared for when it does happen. I want us to create an environment where our kids feel safe enough to come to us when it does happen. And don't you dare think this is only a problem for the creepy old guy lurking in the bushes, all right? Good people, both male and female, are struggling with this sin. Well, if they're looking at that smut, then they're not good people. You know, they're perverts. Listen, just stop right there. If your kids hear that kind of stuff coming out of your mouth, then is there any chance they're going to come to you when they get exposed to it, right? And they will get exposed to it at some point. You know, we, we are going to restrict and, and take precautions and be careful to limit that exposure or to make, push that exposure off as long as we can, but it will happen. And so promise your kids that they won't get in trouble If they come to you, promise that you won't shame them or be disappointed. Promise that you'll help them, not punish them. But enough about passion. What's the second trap that ensnared these widows? Well, according to the Apostle Paul, they became busybodies and gossips. Again, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Because technology has opened up a whole new way of getting up into other people's business. Lies and rumors can spread instantly, reputations destroyed in a moment. You can silence a physical bully by punching him in the nose if you want, but kids are defenseless against cyber bullies. And if someone has more social clout than you, there's not much you can do online to defend yourself. The mob will side with them against you out of fear that they'll be next. Again, just to be realistic, there's not much you can do to fight a cyber bully. But that doesn't mean our kids are powerless. I really believe we need to teach our kids the power of self-control. They cannot control what other people do. Sometimes they will truly be innocent victims. Jesus certainly was, right? But they can control themselves. And just because they can't stop the other person doesn't mean they're powerless against them. They can choose not to strike back. They can choose not to sully the reputation of somebody else. Let's face it, some kids are really nasty, 
Kids have always been nasty, but they just have new ways of being nasty today. But your kid doesn't need to be one of them. Empower him or her to be a Jesus person. The strongest man in the world is the one who can control himself. Finally, the third trap into which these disinterested widows fell into was they became idlers. In other words, they engaged in time-wasting. Need I say more? Technology has opened up vast new worlds of time-wasting. Before we had kids, <laughs> I was determined to forestall all video games. They were a waste of time. And later I was determined to never allow them to carry smartphones. Isn't that what Christians always do? If something might be bad, then we need to ban it. And there's no question that kids waste their time on their devices. There's no question. Adults waste their time on their devices. You know, the old curmudgeons like to point out, all your kids do all day is look at their iPhones. And folks, that's not helpful. It's really not. You know, you can't imagine what parents are dealing with nowadays. You can't. And yes, there's risk involved in giving a, a teenager a smartphone. There is. It's a potential time waster, not to mention all the other things we've talked about today. But there's risk involved with everything. And we've decided, you know, sometimes you just got to take a risk because you want your kids to have a healthy social life, right? And, and we want them to be able to interact with their friends, hopefully in a positive way. And like it or not, all that happens to their smartphones in this culture. Otherwise, they're completely left out of the conversation, anything social. But we don't need to justify ourselves. What I'm asking is just give today's parents a break. They're not raising the generation previous. They're doing the best they can. And so let's review real quick. There are three traps that technology sets before us and our children. According to scripture, technology provides a ready outlet for sexual exploitation. Technology offers an easily accessible platform for gossip and bullying. And technology tends to suck up all of our time. Just as it was for the widows who suddenly found themselves with all kinds of time on their hands, so it is for us in our convenient lives thanks to technology. So what do we do? Because I'm not going to stand up here and give you the seven tips for navigating technology with your children sermon. I'm not going to do that. Good parents don't just try to modify their children's outward behavior. They go for real heart change. And scripture gets to the heart of the matter every time. So let's see what Paul advised these widows to do. We're going to give you some hope today, okay? Because I'm a beleaguered parent just like you. We're going to give you hope today. From the Apostle Paul, let's finish off that little thought he has. 1 Timothy 5, finishing off in verse 15. He says, So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, and manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. What? Is a solution for our kids to get married and bear children? Well, eventually maybe, but not yet. Remember, that was the solution in the context for these young widows. Paul told them to stop concerning themselves with everyone else's business and just tend to their own affairs. And I think that's the best advice we can give to our kids when it comes to this. Technology has shown them all the problems in the world in the blink of an iPhone, but as we've already said, technology has done nothing to fix those problems, right? There's constant outrage in the cesspool of social media. And evidently, nothing ever gets better because the outrage never stops. They have gotten a nonstop dose of nihilism, fatalism, cynicism. So, if that's the case, why not just indulge in pornography? Why not fill our heads with useless garbage? Why not squander our days on video games and YouTube clips and the Kardashians. The world is unfixable. But why did Paul tell those widows to get married, bear children, and manage their own households in their context? He wasn't being chauvinistic. He was trying to narrow their focus on meaningful things they could do in their own spheres of influence in their particular context. Don't concern yourself with global problems about which you can't really do anything and concern yourself with your own business about which you can do something. 
And that's our application from today's passage. The application is this. It's in your bulletin. Fix you, not the universe. Fix you, not the universe. That goes for kids, what we encourage them to do. That goes for parents. That goes for everybody. Right? This series that we're doing for the next four weeks, it's for everybody. Just the specific applications will be aimed to parents. Fix you, not the universe. We've talked about Leo Tolstoy before. He's held in high esteem around here. Leo Tolstoy was a world changer. If you're not familiar, Tolstoy was the 19th century Russian author of War and Peace, so go out and read it this week. You'll enjoy it. (laughs) But it wasn't Tolstoy's novels that changed the world. It was his philosophy. Tolstoy converted to Christianity later in life but he was so controversial as a Jesus follower that the Russian Orthodox Church excommunicated him. They even commissioned a painting entitled Leo Tolstoy in Hell. That's right, they hated him so much they painted a picture of him in Hell. Seems a bit juvenile. But Tolstoy was a firm believer in a literal interpretation of Scripture and the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, he was a promoter of nonviolent resistance before it was cool. This, of course, made him very unpopular with the Russian government, which was constantly trying to justify its wars, and it made him unpopular with the established church, which was constantly trying to appease the government. But Tolstoy's stubborn resistance inspired future generations of social warriors, including men like Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Perhaps you've heard of them. So Tolstoy knew a thing or two about changing the world. He knew a thing or two about engaging in meaningful work. So what advice would Tolstoy give to our kids today who so desperately want to make a difference because they're bombarded with all this nihilism from from social media and the technology and all that? How would he challenge them who so desperately want to make a difference but don't know how to do it and are losing hope and so they're engaging in all these frivolous activities? Here's what Tolstoy said. In his political pamphlet entitled Three Methods of Reform, he let everyone in on his little secret of world changing. He said this, there can be only one permanent revolution, a moral one, the regeneration of the inner man. How is this revolution to take place? Nobody knows how it will take place in humanity, but every man feels it clearly in himself. And yet in our world, everybody thinks of changing humanity, but nobody thinks of changing humanity himself. Pretty powerful words, isn't it? Do you know where Tolstoy got this idea? The Apostle Paul had a world-changing message and mission. Jesus would save anyone from their sins who simply trusted in his perfect life, his death on the cross for their sins, and his resurrection. He said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet she, he shall live. You can be saved right now by trusting in Jesus and his death on the cross and his perfect life and his resurrection. Aside from any works, isn't that good news? That's a life-changing, that's a world-changing message. The Jesus message brought good news for individuals and men living the Jesus life would bring healing to the world through real love and genuine good works. But did Paul tell everyone to run out into the world as he was doing and just fix it all? No, he told the church in Thessalonica to do this. He said, but we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. In other words, marry, bear children, manage your households. In other words, work, love people, and take care of your family. In other words, tend to your own world. In other words, kids, improve yourself. Pornography is rotting your mind and your soul. So come and get help. We'll help you. It will make you a better person. And kids, you can't control others. So worry about what you can control, you. You can't control that bully. You can't control the power brokers and and the racists and the polluters. But as Tolstoy said, 
it does no good to scream about the problems in this world until you work on the problems in your own heart. He got that from Paul. Commit to working on the things you can fix. But that will require you to spend less time in frivolous technological pursuits and more time helping people, taking care of your brothers and sisters, being a Jesus person at school, and doing the things that matter. You don't need to change the world. That's God's job. Just change yourself. I think that's what we need to encourage for our children. The days of Mary Poppins are over. Technology has changed everything in the blink of an iPhone. But it hasn't fixed people. And you know what? You can't fix people either. <laughs> can't fix the universe. All you can do is work on yourself. And that, kids, is something technology can't help you to do. Parents, when your kids are young, we can monitor their devices. We can limit their screen time. We can control their behavior to a certain extent. But as they become closer and closer to adults, behavior modifications doesn't work. They need to want to be a Jesus person. They need to want to become better. So let's help them focus on the things that really matters and what really matters is their hearts. That's what it means for them to manage their own households rather than busying themselves with their basest desires. Boy, parenting is a daunting task, isn't it? And parents are so tired. Well, I'm not able to give you more energy, but I can give you more encouragement. And so I'm going to encourage you to read Luke 10, 38 through 42 this week. Not just parents, it's going to be applicable to everybody. Luke 10, 38 through 42 this week. And because you're so busy, parents, it's only like four or five verses, so we're good. And then you bring a friend next Sunday. Don't forget we've got our invite cards in the back. Grab one before you leave. And we're going to find some inspiration for trapped and burned out parents. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for the good parents in this room. There's just such wonderful, caring people. And, and Lord, we have uh, grandparents in this room. And, and Lord, we have people who don't have children. But Lord, I know this is applicable to all of us. God, I just pray for our parents specifically, though, that, Lord, they have a hard task and they're tired and they're navigating pitfalls and traps that no other generation had to worry about before when it comes to this kind of stuff. God, I pray that you would encourage them. I pray that they would, every time they come to church, they would feel filled up and not empty. They would leave encouraged and optimistic, not sad and discouraged. Lord, this is such a difficult topic. I thank you that you've given us freedom. Lord, I just really pray that today that that um, you would help us to protect our kids. And Lord, as they get older, that we could help them to want to do what's right, to help them engage in meaningful things that will improve themselves. Thank you for these little kids who run around here, Lord. Um, they're downstairs now, but they come on Wednesdays. And I thank you for them, God. I thank you that we have a lot of them. I really pray that you would just raise those kids to be Jesus' people. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.